Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and today's guest is a very interesting guy. He's a former professional boxer, trained by heavyweight champ Floyd Patterson, quite an amazing thing there, a former criminal investigator who's worked on many high-profile cases before becoming an instructor at the Criminal Justice Institute. And Dr. Rich Grego is also a professor of philosophy and world religion at Florida State College in Jacksonville, who earned his PhD with a dissertation on Krishnamurti and Thich Nhat Hanh. So, like I said, interesting guy. And for those of you who've been around Skeptico for a while, you recognize Rich as someone who's been on the show before, somebody I lean to kind of weigh in on topics. He was recently on the interview that I did with Dr. Donald Hoffman, and he provided some great analysis there. But he's also done some interviews for Skeptico over the years, so it's always great to connect with him. And Rich, thanks for joining me on this one. Thanks again for having me, man. So, uh, Interesting guy. Like I said, you know, mm. I, I'm doing this and we've talked a couple times and uh, we have like a good rapport going back and forth, but I kind of re dug into your background and it's really, really interesting. And it's particularly relevant to these kind of things that we've been talking about today and that we're going to be getting into in terms of you know, what kind of background it really takes to be able to engage in the discourse that we need to when we start getting into extended consciousness or talks about evil or those kind of things. What else can we, what else can we know from your background that you think is kind of maybe coming into play with the work that you've done and the worldview that you have? Well, wow. I mean, I don't know. You've really done substantial justice. You're a pretty good investigator yourself. I could have used your help back in the day. Uh, I didn't realize you knew that much about my, my background. But in terms of the, the path that led me here, I guess it has a lot to do with the fact that, yeah, I, I, you know, I suppose of being a, a professional philosopher, and I, I suppose a trained historian, I guess, too, uh, is sort of one branch of the, the quest for, for ultimate meaning and truth. I, you know, I certainly... It's just investigation in a practical context, doing a criminal investigation or any other kind is also essentially about the, the very same thing. So I've been sending you a ton of these interviews I've been doing lately, and they're kind of all over the board on stuff. I've been to Anna Kalukas, mm. who's been a victim of what turns out is satanic ritual abuse mm -hmm. since the time she was six years old, sold into sex slavery. And then mm -hmm. I sent you an interview with Christian fundamentalist guy who deals with it that is deals with satanic ritual abuse from a whole different basis so i've sent you a bunch of these along with these interviews i've done with scholars and i've been like how are we supposed to sort this out mm -hmm. and i i think one of the things that emerged from that discussion is your background as a criminal investigator and how that might I don't know. There's a worldliness to that where it's like, you know, <laughs> come on, yeah, man, yeah, yeah, this yeah. guy, this guy is a creep and he's done <laughs> these horrible things. And yeah. as a criminal investigator, you know, you have yeah. to play both sides. You're like, Hey, I can't, yeah. you know, be too prejudiced. But on the other hand, I know this guy's a creep and I got to nail him. And mm -hmm. oh, there's, that is, that's needed. I think that kind of lack of naivete is needed and and is wanting in some of these interviews i've done and yeah yeah, yeah I, I i certainly i you know and i think the the hugh urban one is particularly salient in that regard isn't it in terms of both you and chris shelton who you subsequently interviewed being kind of frustrated him even maybe more than you with the the lack of any what should, what should I call it? Commitment in the scope of his inquiry. Again, I, I tend to be a both and guy in my thinking versus an either or guy. And I try to, I, I try to reconcile maybe seemingly contradictory views. And I, I think I remember you had, when I did inter, an interview with uh, Stanley Krippner at the American Psychological Association conference, I remember you expressing the exact same 
frustrations. Not exact same. It was a different context, I suppose, but very similar frustrations with him in that connection. And, and I understand that. Um, I guess at the same time, though, I also understand the need for an investigator, whether it's a scholarly investigator or a criminal investigator, to be impartial and unbiased insofar as you can realize that ideal. Because if you, when you're not, right, then you're just doing a polemic. You're doing apologetics instead of an investigation. And that's sure. my big concern, right? You brought up that, that interview you did with uh, Stanley Krippner, and that's a good one. But I tell you what I wanted to do. I wanted to play folks a clip from, uh, from another interview you did for us, one with a guy who uh, you've known for a while and lives down there in Florida, uh, Dr. Hoyt Edge. Mm. And this is from a while back. I had to dig into the archives, but I listened to this interview. And, and, and again, it's one of those where this stuff has come up for a while, and uh, particularly in parapsychology. But I wanted to play you this clip, and then we can chat about it. So here goes. A number of parapsychologists, a lot of them perhaps, want to call the field a part of anomalistic psychology. So Why? long, okay. okay, it is okay. for two reasons. One, it, it is just as Bob, Bob Morris said, what we ought to do if we want to have parapsychology mean something and parapsychology to be paid attention to, if we can contribute something to normal psychology, then they're much more likely to say, oh, these are good people. One that he didn't like. Yeah. I, I, I think he's also uh, p p perhaps been a little unfair. Been also, to explain it away, or that's right. Yeah, that's right. I like Richard. You know, I, I, I know Richard. I, I, I like him. Uh, Susan Blackboard. Uh, right. Blackmore yeah. is the same way. Yes. Uh, yeah. Susan yeah. has stayed yeah. my home and so forth. I yeah. love Susan. Right. You know, these are good, good people. These are good, good people. He is, of course, he's talking about there, uh, Dr. Richard Wiseman, who, yeah. I don't know, we haven't really kept up with him much on this show, but he's a guy I would remind folks that uh, Rupert Sheldrick, who's a pretty measured guy and has that mm. British Cambridge kind of formality, called intentionally deceptive regarding how his how he treated Sheldrick's research. And then uh, Susan Blackmore, more or less out and out lied on this show when she said she wasn't interested in near-death experience mm -hmm. research anymore and she hadn't kept up with it and then the very next month went and did a public presentation on near-death experience this is someone who's naive they're just naive they just don't understand the extent to which these mm -hmm. guys who he says are nice guys are not nice guys and are completely undermining what was parapsychology? I don't even know that parapsychology is relevant anymore, which leads back to the first part of his quote, where he says, gee, if we're just nice enough, then yeah. maybe science will let us in the door and give yeah. us a seat at the table if we can just, you know, convince him that we're really nice guys. This, this just doesn't fly. So that's where I get back to the, you know, criminal investigator looks at it and goes, pal, no, it ain't gonna work <laughs> out for you, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Paul Smith, who I think you, you did a show with uh, on Skeptico, uh, I met him at a, a parapsychology conference and, um, and talked to him about this, that issue in parapsychology there. The, then Paul Smith being the remote viewing guy worked with the uh, right. Army's yeah, program just to, uh, to refresh anybody's memory. And uh, I, I, I remember talking to him about the, that si the si very situation you're addressing and his response is the, the need of the parapsychological community specifically to please the scientific community to, to, to become acceptable to him to it reminds him of Stockholm syndrome in the sense that, you know, it's just, you know, the, the, these people who abuse you and don't understand you and, and are really out to get you are the very ones you're just trying so hard to, 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 to please. And, and I think maybe to some extent you see some of these guys bending over backwards in deference to that project. I want you to weigh in on that further, Rich, because okay. as I was sending you these interviews that I've done, yeah. I was kind of more and more trying to come to grips with the complete disconnect, the complete disconnect here in academia. And you're part of academia. So I'm kind of asking you to 
maybe yeah. do what you cannot yeah. do in terms of, yeah. but how, how bad is it, I guess, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, you know, again, and I, I suppose, you know, I'm of two minds. I'm torn. I, I, I see where you're coming from. I, I really do. On the other hand, I get the, the very rigid commitment of academics and scholars to, to want to maintain, you know, a, 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 a sense of, of impartial and unbiased perspective on the issues that they're discussing, not act as though they have their minds so completely made up about not only the field, but their opponents, you know, the people like Richard Wiseman and Susan Blackmore, and there's millions of them, right, that they're going to sort of name call and dismiss and simply dismiss them. Because then you're not only going to get ignored in the academic community, which, again, it's an important voice. I mean, it may, it, it may not be the only voice, but it's an important voice and it's an important repository of knowledge. But you're also going to get, probably and rightfully so, you're going to discredit yourself in the court of public opinion because you're going to sound biased. You're going to sound um, like you're not a disinterested, detached, uncritical, objective observer. I don't know if people will trust that. And maybe they shouldn't. I, I don't know if that message resonates with you at all. I because I know how you feel. I know you, you're like, look, there's got to be a point where you just sort of call a spade a spade, and and make exactly. a commitment. I, yeah. it, exactly, yeah, exactly. And it's and it's not even so much calling a spade a spade. It's just at some point it's kind of being out of touch with reality. You know, there's a certain reality there, and if if you don't, if you're not coming to grips with it, then what's the point? And so that's, I guess, my thing with Hoyt Edge is, you don't know, you're, it's not going to work out. You are doing that as a specific strategy in this case. And I think this is going to relate to the interview we're going to talk about in a minute with uh, Hugh Urban and then Chris Shelton, of course, who is this former Scientology member yeah. who gets totally screwed over by this cult. And then you got Hugh Urban who can't bring himself to talk about it in those terms and has to dance around. This is a mm. repeat with Hoyt Edge where he's saying, no, mm. these are really nice guys and they really have my best interest at heart. And it's like, it's, it just doesn't work that way. And I don't think science can go forward with that kind of uh, level of just naivete mm -hmm. about the way that the world works. I get where you're coming from. On the other hand, I'm, I'm looking at things from, say, a Hoyt Edge's perspective and thinking, well, you know, so what do you, you know, sort of what do you want him to do? What should he say about Richard Wiseman and Susan Blackmore? He should say I, what Rupert Sheldrick did, which is I've looked at the, I've carefully considered his opinion on this. I've looked at how he's handled the data. And he is intentionally deceptive in this case. And that does yeah. not speak well for him as a trusted researcher. That's everything mm. that Rupert said. And I don't think you have to back off of any of that. Why would we trust someone who's intentionally deceptive? I had Daryl Bam on and he says the same thing. He said it in a little bit nicer terms, but he said, you know, yeah. I don't know if the guy is completely deceptive, but in the case of how he tried to jury rig mm. this phony replication mm. of uh, skeptical stuff, he was being deceptive. So yeah. that to me is clear. And that's mm. where parapsychology has completely run off the rails. And that's why mm. it's no longer relevant. And that's why, you know, when Sam Harris says in the email exchange to me, in his snarky little stupid kind of thing, <laughs> yeah. it's the backwater of science. Everyone goes, well, it must be because that's how they yeah. act. They act like they're the backwater mm. of science. They deserve to be the backwater of science. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like for the sake of argument, I should disagree with you there. But I, I think at least certainly in terms of parapsychology, I, I, it's hard to disagree. I, 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 it seems that way. And again, I suppose I haven't kept up with that research as much as I used to. And that's one of the reasons why. It's just not a very exciting field, in a sense, for me anymore. But um, gosh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, then how can I? Yeah, I, I, I suppose if you, if you really are convinced that the disagreement and the claims being made by those who oppose you are egregious enough that they really are deceptive, that they really are intentionally trying to deceive, um, then you should, certainly you should call them out on it, even if you do it like a gentleman, if you do it in, in, in you know, um, in, in neutral, uh, not neutral, but non-adversarial terms, 
I don't know though if do you do you think I, I wouldn't say that a Hoyt Edge is convinced of that though. I think he gives these guys the benefit of the doubt and assumes well, if he that isn't like convinced, him. That, he, he isn't convinced, and that's the problem. He's mm-hmm. naive. The mm-hmm. evidence is clear. Yeah. We're relying on him to have a clear read of the evidence, and he can't do it. So therefore, he's not relevant, and therefore, mm-hmm. and that's how parapsychology has become irrelevant. Parapsychology is irrelevant. All the so. important people in it have kind of moved on or, or mm. never even joined the club in the first place because they were skeptical of it. It's interesting looking back, we're looking back at an interview that you did in 2012. I mean, is anyone talking about parapsychology mm. anymore? Not really, not that I think of, that I can think of. I mean, uh, you know, who, 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 who are we going to look to? Uh, Dean Radin? Dean Radin. He's always been a little bit kind of, you know, parapsychology, mm. but not exactly out front at the parapsychology mm. conferences and all yeah, that. Yeah. We're kind of doing his own thing over there at IONS, and now he wants mm-hmm. to do the spirit stuff, which is kind of the leap forward, even yeah. though I don't totally, I'm not totally down with what he's doing. It's the leap forward with extended consciousness. It's not staying in this stupid, oh, well, let's kind of look at it as anomalous psychology because yeah. maybe then they'll like us kind of thing. Yeah. It doesn't make any yeah. sense. And, and that's, I guess, that's my point of, of kind of getting into this is that if we're going to talk about comparative religions and we're going to talk about this other, you know, thing that I sent you with uh, Hugh Urban. But my concern is that that whole, that whole branch of the social sciences, including philosophy, is headed yeah. down that same path of parapsychology where they're just completely irrelevant. You know, I, when I listen to Hugh Urban, it's it's irrelevant. He sounds irrelevant. And really, it was it, that it was that uh, frustrating to you that the, the the dialogue you had. No, the entire dialogue wasn't yeah. uh, that frustrating. But at the end of the day, I think his argument, as it stands up to the real guy who was in it, he sounds irrelevant. We've been talking around it, so let me play. Okay play in some clips from that interview. So here is the episode that I did with Dr. Hugh Urban and it's episode 437. And I really did like and enjoy this guy. And I think, you know, probably over a beer, we'd have a great conversation. He's interested in a lot of stuff I'm interested in. And he's a Tantra guy and he's cool. And he, but he's written this book on the church of Scientology and the book, like our friend, Dr. Jeff Kripal at Rice University said, wow, this is a great book. This is, you know, until now, there was no extensive scholarship on Scientology, and this guy has done it, and isn't this great, you know? But the thing that I really kind of hammered him on that led me to you is if you look into Scientology and you look at the history of it, it has this kind of very overt occult connection, you know? So yeah. it's L. Ron Hubbard yeah. and Parsons who are out in the desert in California and they're trying to summon the Antichrist through the horror of Babylon and they're dead serious mm-hmm. about it. And, 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 but here's the thing, it's, it's not that they're dead serious about it. It's that we have to, I think, fully consider whether or not there is any reality to that. And that I think is the question. And that's what I brought up with yeah. Dr. Uh, Dr. Urban. And let me play that clip for us here, and then we'll chat about it a little bit. The part that concerns me is we have reason to believe that okay, mm-hmm. often men who stare at goats. I mean, all this mm-hmm. stuff is going on. And I, so I'm just not sure that we can bracket that back into, oh, you know, those Scientologists, they were kind of playing off of the cold war jitters that Mm. people have but i guess i would say that i can't know as um, a historian of religion whether there's a reality with what they're talking about but i can say that they certainly believed there was and took it very seriously okay so that's what that is that is the crux of it what do you think you know again i guess when i when i i guess we were sort of going back and forth about this a little bit and i made up the uh, criminal investigation analogy I, I kind of get the idea that, again, if, if he wants to be a credible historian, 
and I think he was doing more of a, as I recall the book, I read the book, but it was a while ago, I read the book. Um, he was doing more of a sort of an institutional history of it, wasn't he? Kind of how the, sort of how the organization was formed. And um, he wasn't really talking about their ideas as much, right? I mean, maybe that's irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, well, you, come on. <laughs> okay, so, well, because here is the issue. Here is the issue. Yeah. If we fly up ten thousand feet and we look at how Scientology uh, interfaces with our culture, yeah, it's a cult, right? You talk to anybody at this point, and they go, "Yeah, it's a cult." I know. I saw the woman on TV who's on the Expo say, <laughs> "It's a cult. It's a cult. It's a cult." Yeah. And, and now yeah. we have this total disconnect because I'm talking to this respected Ohio State University professor, and he's going, well, you know, it's a new religious movement, and we have to understand that we can't, you know, be too quick to condemn. It's like, no, this, so now it's back to White Edge. No, dude, it's a cult. You don't get it. I, I think I'm a little bit even more sympathetic with the historian's perspective here, because what he's trying to do, and, and, and again, is do precisely what the general public in a sense doesn't do right i mean if we if we allowed sort of um you know the, whatever the fashionable trends and what you hear in pop culture to determine what the truth of a situation is then why would we need courts why would we need scholars you know why would we need criminal investigators you're the both and guy and you're kind of playing the slippery slope game here no i think we can have both we can have like I'm telling you, I'm going to hold up Rupert in that case, because Rupert can right. say, look, I tried to do this research with Richard Wiseman, and he mm. was intentionally deceptive. Yeah. He's deceptive in doing research. He's re deceptive mm. in reporting that research. That is important. We don't need to kind of dance around yeah. that. And, and so then the same way, I think, you know, what – what I think the objection to what Dr. Hugh Urban is saying comes from, again, we've referenced this, but now I'll play it, this interview that I did with Chris Shelton, who is a, yeah. I guess we got to call it for what it is, because I asked him if that's okay to call it that, and that's that he's a victim of Scientology. So let me play that clip, and then we can kind of talk about that. If you're going to publish an academic paper about Scientology, you better have something to say. And if what you have to say is simply regurgitated Scientology promotional materials, and I am intimately familiar with Scientology's promotional materials, I wrote them. You know? So I, I understand how Scientology presents itself to the world, and I understand the curtain or veil behind which Scientology operates and what they do when people aren't around is Dr. Urban, Urban just being duped here? He's just being taken in. Uh, you know, and in, in, in regard to uh, Chris Shelton's claims there, uh, having read the book, and again, uh, you know, he, and he's obviously more, more, you know, knowledgeable about Scientology's promotional materials, but I never got the impression that I was reading a biased account in favor of Scientology or to try to make them look good or to try to be a public service announcement for them when I was reading Hugh Urban's book. In fact, interestingly, after I read it, and this was a while ago, I came away with some very, with a much worse view of Scientology, at least as an institution, than I had previously. I didn't know a lot of the things that he revealed. I, I mentioned it to, I, I know several people in the Church of Scientology are very well I won't say well placed, they're very prominent in the organization. They, 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 they've, you know, they do uh, these classes themselves they're very uh they they've, they're up to those what do they call them ot levels on the bridge they call it they're at the highest ot levels which in scientology means that you've attained the highest spiritual state you can and so they're very what they're very prominent in the in the institution and i mentioned it to to one of them and apparently they went out and read it themselves and they were going to send me a bunch of um uh mistakes that he had made uh, that that urban had made making scientology look bad when he shouldn't have or in other words casting them in an unfairly bad light so i mean i don't know and as a criminal investigator again i i, I think it's great to hear all these victim and you know sort of witness eyewitness statements as a criminal investigator you'd call them from from people who have endured um you know scientology's worst practices 
but again, the, the, the value, as a criminal investigator, the value of a victim or witness statement is great and it's important, but it's also limited by the very intimate vantage point that it gives you on a, on a situation. I don't think you really buy that, but I, well, I, I can sympathize well, it's, with it's that. It's not that I don't buy it. Let me hit it from a different from okay. a different angle that I think you, you can definitely relate to, and we'll see how this plays. Beyond the Eckhart, Oprah Winfrey, New Age thing that most people get, what he's saying about science, the science of consciousness, is much, much closer to what leading researchers are saying. So I guess returning to kind of this earlier point, if you can't get consciousness right, if you're playing with the consciousness is an illusion, as your atheist colleague no doubt believes, you're not even in the game. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And I, I guess I would say that, well, there's a couple of answers to that question. Um, that there is a movement in religious studies and other fields that is extremely interested in consciousness from different perspectives. But in my own work, I mean, I'm a historian. And so I look at what people do and the text they leave behind and what we can sort of see. Okay, so I think that this puts a different angle, a different spin on mm -hmm. what I keep pounding. And I want you to pound back. That's what I like. That's yeah. what Skeptico is about. But he's in, he, he is forced, Dr. Urban is forced to come at this from an atheistic, biological robot, meaningless universe perspective. The head of you think so? That, that, that's who the head of his department, right? Yes, if you listen, you to the think, whole oh, okay, go ahead. if you listen to the whole interview early on, yeah. he says, hey, you know, I mean, you, you really hold his feet to the fire, and it's like some <laughs> interviews, other interviews I've done with yeah. academics, and uh, you know, they go, Look, man, I can't publish with that, mm -hmm. I may believe that that's true, but I can't get that published. You know, Hugh, Hugh is out there doing uh. Tantra, he's, he's joining some Tantra obscure community in India that yeah. has these ancient connections to the Tantric tradition. And when you ask him, he says, yeah, of course, I do rituals. I do these other things because I immerse myself in what's going on there. And anthropologically, that maybe may have its disadvantages, but I don't see any other way to do it. So mm -hmm. he is entering the extended consciousness yeah. realm. And then he's coming back and telling us, yeah, but when I write about this, or when I have to talk about this, I have to create this, you know, kind of false reality that says I have to jam this back into this goofy materialistic thing. And that's why I think the whole thing comes out as gobbledygook. Again, I, fair point. Um, but I, but I, I hit to push back a little bit. I, I don't know if, if this particular guy doing this particular kind of research in that particular case, meaning a, the institutional sort of history of Scientology, feels that he is in a position to make judgments about the veridicality, if that's, is that the issue? The veracity of their, of their beliefs and on, on that basis. See, but I think you're going I, back on the email that you sent me. I'm calling you <laughs> out on it, Rich. Okay. Because, All right. because he's going to go back on one or the other, right? He's going to have mm -hmm. a certain paradigm, a certain uh, mindset, worldview, and then he's yeah. going to go back on it. So he's adopted one which is this humanistic, atheistic one. Did you, see, I didn't get that from the book. I, I, I just, I, I, I would, at the end of the book, I found myself wanting to know that because like you, that's what I'm really interested in. That, that would have been the me. I wasn't really that impressed with the book actually because of that. I thought so you're a good guy to play along with me here. <laughs> but I, I go back, the, the, the hook for me was the L. Ron Hubbard and Jack Parsons in mm. the desert yeah. Summoning yeah. the Antichrist. Yeah. Me too. Right? Yeah. So this is the this is the point where all this comes to a head. And if you're Hugh Urban, you go, well, that doesn't really matter. What matters is that they believed it. No, <laughs> you got that completely wrong. That is secondary. That is completely secondary to whether or not there is any possible reality to them making contact, making connection with an extended consciousness realm and that, conscious, that extended consciousness realm interacting with us 
and in the formation of this religion. That's what matters most. It's not whether they believed it or not. Yeah, I, I agree personally, but I get if somebody feels as though that's beyond their, the, you know, the, their, you know, the, you're, you're, you, don't, you don't buy that? You think, you think if you do that deep a study, I guess is what you're saying, that if you've done that deep a study of Scientology and what the people are all about and what they're saying and doing, that you should at least be able to commit yourself to some um, statement about the veracity of what they're doing and well, what they believe? I think it's a slightly different issue. It goes back to, to Rupert and Richard Wiseman, Rupert Sheldrick and Richard Wiseman. I can't look into the soul of Richard Wiseman and exactly. tell whether and tell whether he was being intentionally deceptive. Okay. What I can do is I can look at his behavior, and this is to the mm. criminal investigator mm. model. I mm. can look at the behavior and say, you know, was there criminality here? In yeah. in the case of Richard Wiseman, did yeah. he perform his duties as a fair and honest researcher? And I would say, no, he didn't. And therefore, when Hoyt Edge says these are good people, he's missed the point. The mm. point is, were yeah. They, yeah. was he deceptive? And I would say the same thing is here true. If you, mm. cannot, if you cannot come to some determination as to whether or not there's a reality to that extended consciousness realm, then you need to stop everything you're doing. <laughs> And you need to do as much research as you can in order to determine the reality or non-reality of that. You can't yeah. pretend like that isn't the main thing. How about this? And I, I just, I'm reading a history of, of Western uh, anthropology. And you're right, there's, that's a big issue there, right? Where you, you go in and you observe a culture and its practices and beliefs. And, you know, the, the, the you know, should you as a, as a, as a, disinterested spectator, which is essentially what, right, an anthropologist, an anthropologist theoretically supposed to be a fly on the wall. Should you be then drawing conclusions about whether their, you know, by our standards, mystical beliefs um, have any substance or not? Or should you, is your job just to describe how they feel and, and reserve judgment? Um, I, and I, I, you know, there's things to be said on both sides of that. But I, but I, I, I get why anthropologists would, for instance, and, and that's essentially what, what Hugh Urban was doing, right? Um, I get why they want to be a disinterested fly on the wall instead of going that one step further. Just to, in other words, just describing, telling you what Scientologists believe as opposed to saying, well, they're full of crap or, or they're not, or I believe them. It's up to me to say whether they're full of crap because I get to do my little thing here. But right. what I do think they have to do is they have to be able to, and, and again, this is, came out in the email exchange that we had, is that they need to understand that they are never a disinterested party. Mm -hmm. They need to understand that mm -hmm. what the science at the very least tells us is that we are interacting with that which we observe, and we can understand that more than just a, from a pure subatomic physics standpoint. We can also understand that, as many anthropologists have, is that from a cultural standpoint, we cannot get in there and just be this observer who doesn't affect it, right? So when you leave your machete behind in the forest to mm -hmm. the culture that never had a machete and you come back three years later and you find that it's the Lord of the flies <laughs> and whoever has the machete is now the king. Yeah. You, know, <laughs> yeah. you, you were yeah. always part of the process and how yeah. that gets played out is, is, is just the way that it is. Yeah, I guess so. On the other hand, you know, I, I, again, to, 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 to uh, draw on experience from my, my criminal investigating days, you know, I, 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 was, I was a polygraph examiner as well. And I, I got the credential. And I was trained in it. And I sometimes did polygraph examinations. And I did one in a big capital case. And they, they actually called me in to testify, which doesn't usually happen because usually they don't like polygraph. They don't admit polygraph evidence in court. But this time they did. And I was testifying for the defense attorney and it was weird it was it was at a sentencing hearing of all things after the verdict of guilt had been determined i'm not really sure why he wanted this evidence entered but i testified that this guy had essentially passed my polygraph test and the, interestingly now the attorney there he was asking me about it and we went through the the whole thing and at the end of uh, of my statement to him 
in court there, he said, well, you know, so in your opinion, then this guy is innocent of the charges, right? And I said, well, I'm not really qualified to, and then maybe, maybe Alex, this is where Alex Secures would get mad at me. I, I said, I'm not really qualified to attest to that. All I did, and, and the reason is, the re all, is because all I did on that case was do one forensic, I took one forensic kind of narrow look at the circumstances and provided the testimony that came from my narrow perspective on it, like any forensic person does in a case. And that was all I felt responsibly required, or responsibly compelled to, to, to talk about the person's guilt with reference to the entire scenario that I wasn't an expert in and I hadn't done an investigation on, I thought would, was wrong to do. And the attorney kept pushing me to do that and I wouldn't do it and he got mad. So, I mean, again, I don't know if that's exactly analogous, but to me, maybe- well, Let's make it analogous. What if I asked you to defend the idea that we need to take a balanced look at Scientology as a new religious movement that will stand beside other religions that we respect and admire and we shouldn't be kind of too swayed by uh, personal accounts and testimony like that of Chris Shelton, who says this is a cult. I was in it. I know that it's a cult. It's a destructive cult. It's been incredibly, you know, harmful to all these people that I can bring forward. Uh, how would you, how would you give a balanced view of that in defense of, uh, you know, anyone who writes a book in in that balanced kind of way? Um. You mean, how would they be justified in doing that? How would you defend Scientology as a new religious oh. movement? I'm really vague on what, and because I think it is sort of a vague concept on what a cult is as opposed to a religion. We, it's a term we throw around a lot, but... Um, what is I, a cult then? What, what is an example of something that you think is clearly a cult? I guess I don't. I, th that's why, and again, this is where I guess I'm more um, sympathetic to the, the the Hugh Urban perspective on these things. I um, it, 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 I don't know if you'd agree with this, but to me, cult is is just sort of a vague term that 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 says nothing, but carries a lot of biased baggage with it. So as opposed to religion, label, as opposed to religion, but how how is it a better? How is religion as a word, in as general, a definition, any better? Any better, maybe. That's a good, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. You know, I, I feel like you're kind of trying to box here with one arm tied behind your yeah. back, which I guess is yeah. a training technique <laughs> that sometimes boxers employ. Yeah. You could yeah. tell us about that. <laughs> you got a weak left, tie the right behind your back. <laughs> But here's the thing. It comes yeah. back to me of the extended consciousness. Yeah. And if you get consciousness wrong, then yeah, you yeah. wind up with all this silly, goofy stuff of what's a cult, what's a religion, what's spirituality, because underlying it, there is no spirituality, right? I mean, there's just a social mm -hmm. construct. It's just mm -hmm. something that we invented. It's not real. It doesn't make any sense. It's all gobbledygook until you wrestle the consciousness issue to the ground, isn't it? It is certainly is to me and obviously to you too. But what about people who just aren't interested in the consciousness issue and they just want to explore Scientology as an institution? Uh, maybe, you know, I, I was just thinking, I was looking at on one of my bookshelves. I have a history of European socialism on my bookshelf that I had reviewed for a course. I, I forget, it was either a course in Western civilization or a course in moral and political philosophy, but I didn't know much about the subject. I, I got this very dry, clinical, disinterested history of European socialism by some guy at Yale. And frankly, if that book had been written, because I just wanted to be informed on the subject, if that book had been written by Joe McCarthy or Karl Marx or, or maybe Joseph Stalin, I wouldn't have wanted to read it, I don't think. Because if I really want to, all I wanted to get for those purposes was a, was a sort of a, a quick, unbiased, disinterested account of socialism and the, and 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 I, I don't know maybe you don't see the comparison here but again if somebody just wants to read about the history of Scientology what happened I mean how are we gonna get data about things that we can use to make evaluations if everybody who's looking at it has an agenda beforehand right 
I guess I'd answer your question of why or what's wrong with it kind of from a different perspective, and that is from the philosophy and science perspective, since you are a professor of philosophy. So I have up on the screen the very famous quote from physicist Stephen Hawking, who told the Google Zeitgeist Conference that philosophers have not kept up with science and their art is dead, which I think probably did more for philosophy <laughs> in terms of giving it a good kick in the butt yeah. than anything that has occurred in the last 20 years. But I would juxtapose that with the interview that you just helped me on with Dr. Donald Hoffman, because physicist Donald Hoffman, when he comes out and says, well, look, space time is doomed. And every experiment we've done with deep, deep physics, subatomic physics, quantum physics has proven over and over again that consciousness is fundamental. And we don't have any contradiction to those experiments. Then I think this is my conclusion. He doesn't say this quite directly, but I think it's a natural inference is that materialist scientists, and I would add all the social scientists that just follow along in their wake pretending have not kept up with consciousness research and their art is dead. Mm. So that would be my response to, you know, what yeah, you said. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, if Hugh Urban and Ohio State University wants to go on and still bilk students into coming in and paying for those classes and giving them phony baloney degrees, I don't care. I mean, it doesn't really bother me that much, but their art is dead. There's nothing to it at the core because they haven't kept up with consciousness research. They, they, and that's where we got to give Hawking credit. He, he, he does put his finger on something. You know, if you don't keep up with the science, then you risk being left behind. You risk yeah. a deadening of your art. So what do you think? I guess you can't, you certainly can't ignore the science, but I mean, there's, there obviously there's more to reality and more things to consider than just that. Well, um, hold, hold on, because you made a great point when we were talking about Donald Hoffman. And I, I want to broaden, if I can, our understanding of what we're defining as science. And I'm talking about science as this, process this method for moving forward with our knowledge or at least right. creating the illusion that we're moving forward because yeah. we may yeah. not be moving forward <laughs> yeah. at all and you understand yeah. that from a deeper spiritual yeah. perspective mm -hmm. but in terms of all the stuff you're talking about mm -hmm. gathering data sifting through the data trying to find out a valid and invalid interpretations of the data i would call all that science mm -hmm. and i would say that yeah philosophers are doing that kind of science in the same way that sure. physicists are doing that kind of science. But the caution is still the same. If you don't understand consciousness science, mm. then your art is dead. And that mm. is my claim with mm. regards to, you know, all these guys who we're talking about, who we're relying on to give us some kind of view of the world. I tend to agree with your, your, your worldview and the prominent place that you give consciousness studies. But then, you know, it's kind of like that way. They kind of felt that way about the, the, the Scientology book. I mean, so how do you, how do we, how do we account for people who just don't agree with us? I guess, you, so you're willing to just say, well, they're just wrong. They're deluded. And I can say that. And I guess I do say that, but you know, if yeah. I was going to put it in more polite terms, like you're kind of, asking for, I would suggest that if you're not engaging with the data mm -hmm. in a thoughtful way, then the value yeah. of your opinion needs to reflect that. So it, it's like, you know, unfortunately, after my interview with Chris Shelton, who... <laughs> yeah, I was wondering what, if, uh, yeah. what came of the exchange yeah. of uh, and, information. And I'll talk more about that, but it's the same yeah. old thing. He sends me these books Mm. And, and so we're having this debate about Psy and all mm. I have to do is go to the books and do a quick look inside on Amazon. Raiden, no. Mm. Bem, no. Mm. Sheldrick, no. So yeah. are the books that he sent me by these trusted academics, mm. are they engaging with the data? Clearly they're not. So yeah. can I, can I kind of, 
make a cut, you know, I have to cut the team there. Can I cut them mm. off the roster? I can. They're just not mm. engaging with the data. Yeah. And I don't yeah. mind people who are at least engaging with the data, but. Yeah. And that, that's, that's a big issue for me. And, and I've, I've often wanted to ask you about that. Do you think that it is possible? Because I gather you don't for somebody who really takes a complete comprehensive and objective look at the data to come to to come to a conclusion that is different from yours? Or do you think that any reasonable sane person who looks at that data has to agree with Alex Securus? It's a real yeah. question. It's a loaded question. But I, I think how we, how we all kind of deal with this stuff is we have certain litmus tests mm. that we develop, mm. you yeah. know? Yeah. Like, I, I, I've shared this with people, but I was never into conspiracies. <laughs> Mm. at all mm -hmm. before doing the show yeah. and it was the conspiracy of science and consciousness in particular yeah. and this this conspiracy that you are a biological robot in a meaningless universe and how that meme gets perpetuated in the face of all the data against it it just mm -hmm. led me and said wait there's something more going on here than Point Edge's explanation that they're just really good guys that got something wrong. Mm. So I started looking at other areas where people s saw the same thing and conspiracy research is one of it. So I started with a really tame one. Mm -hmm. I started with JFK, yeah. which the JFK assassination, if people don't know this, and a lot of people still <laughs> don't because I have still people to say lone nut assassin, mm. Har Lee Harvey Oswald, that, just so you know, folks, that is not the official conclusion of the United States government. The final subcommittee investigating the assassination came to the conclusion, not that they should be the ultimate authority because <laughs> they're not in my opinion, but even they came to the conclusion that it was a conspiracy and that it was that the lone nut assassin thing didn't hold. Yes. So I look at it like, wow. So, so that is a litmus test for me, when I talk to someone and they say, oh, no, I've seen it, you know, no, it's nothing to it. It's a lone nut assassin. I'm like, you haven't engaged with the data. Mm -hmm. I've watched probably yeah. more of it than, than I should have. Yeah. The same thing with like 9-11, I hate to say. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know that triggers a lot of people, but 9-11, uh, you know, I just ran across a guy the other day and we're talking, we're having a good conversation. And he's telling me how he just finished a 700 page book on 9-11. I was, ah, interesting. So what do you think about building seven? And he goes, what do you, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. I go, you don't know building seven. I said, you don't know the 47 story steel framed building that wasn't hit by any debris and mm -hmm. is the only building in history to ever fall from office furniture fire. Again, I don't care what your conclusion at this point, I don't care what your conclusion mm -hmm. is. But if you don't know that, if you don't right. understand that data yeah. point, if you haven't dealt with it, if you haven't yeah. said, well, I think the NIST report, which they filed as uh, top secret in terms of their modeling in the face of other academics who reported it openly, their model of it, you know, I, I would trust that. Or if you say, well, I, don't, I can't explain why the 9-11 commission makes no mention of it. <laughs> you know, if you're yeah. not engaged with that data, yeah. then do we really have anything to talk about here? Yeah. So that's how I feel to a certain extent about these guys. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. if you haven't engaged with the data at that point, and I have to say everyone on this screen, I'm talking about Jeff Kripal, Gregory Shushan, Brian Hayden, Dr. Hugh Urban, they have engaged with it. In, in, so in that case, it's kind of the second point that we mm. haven't really dealt with, but I'm trying to drag you into kind of the conspiracy <laughs> thing is because what I hear him saying is, you know, I've tried to engage with it, but I'm not really allowed to yeah. engage with yeah. it because my institution and yeah. academia in general really won't let me engage yeah. with it. Yeah. Uh, that I wonder though, too. And, and I, th th this is what one of the, re one of the things I, bunch of questions I had for you. I mean, one of which was um, what, if Hugh Urban was to come to a, a, a conclusion, was to actually have, have the moral fortitude or whatever, to, to actually commit himself to a conclusion regarding what Scientology 
and his history of it tells us about the nature of consciousness, what would that be? And then the other one is a larger point, a larger question that I had for you, which is what does all of this stuff, because the, the, the more I listen to Skeptico and engage with the evidence that's presented on it and the sources that your, your people give and that you refer people to, I'm starting to see these connections myself. And I'm wondering if there is some larger pattern that you can draw a, a, a conclusion from. I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. I would, I would really take a more measured approach, much like you did in your polygraph testimony, which is to say that I, I don't know and I don't have to know. And in order to falsify or point out the weaknesses in someone else's argument, doesn't mean that I have to present a solid case that I know everything. And in yeah. terms of what I wanted from Hugh Urban, and I'm really picking on Hugh Urban and throwing him under the well, he shouldn't come out that way because yeah. I respect the guy. And, 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 you know, I also had up on the screen, you know, Brian Hayden, who mm -hmm. a, a lot of times I, I, it sounds like I'm being negative on these people. I have a ton of respect for Brian Hayden. I learned a ton from Brian Hayden, who's done this cross-cultural analysis of this kind of self-aggrandizement thing. So mm -hmm. he said, hey, when I look at these cultures and i find the kind of i don't i want to don't want to throw the wrong native american tribe under the bus so i'm not even going to say but this one tribe who had a chief who said hey pal got a good deal for you tell you what let me sleep with your wife and you know i'm talking to the gods so i could kind of <laughs> put in a good word for you if you let me do that and they said that you should really let me do that so he's saying hey, th th does this look legit to you? It doesn't look mm -hmm. legit to me. So mm -hmm. therefore, we should be skeptical of all the claims that are being made mm -hmm. about interactions with the extended consciousness realm. I say right on to that. Or, you know, Dr. Mm -hmm. Gregory Shushan, who I have up on the screen, who does a cross-cultural analysis of near-death experience and says, hey, there are these very significant differences in how NDEs are understood across cultures. But I'm kind of bearing the point because what I really wanted Hugh Urban to say is that this burden of proof thing, which mm. I come back to in the analogy, I always, it's not even an analogy, the comparison I always make is to the Catholic church and I always relate it back to the fall of Arthur Anderson, which was the largest accounting yeah. firm in the country and was asked to close its doors or did have to close its doors and send everyone home. And many people lost millions of dollars in 401ks and lives were destroyed. But they said, hey, you had a responsibility, a public fiduciary responsibility to hold this trust. You so violated that, that Arthur Anderson, you shouldn't be in business anymore. Well, the same is true of the Catholic Church. Catholic Church should just be shut down without making any judgment on whether it's done good things or it's charities around the world. You just would say, you had a certain responsibility. You failed that responsibility clearly. You don't need to exist anymore as a new religious movement or an old religious movement, or whatever you want to call it. So that's what I wanted Hugh Urban to say, is to say, hmm. you know, based on the evidence at hand, the burden of proof would be on Scientology to clearly demonstrate that it is not a destructive cult that destroys people's lives. And until they can overcome that burden of proof, then we should regard them as a cult because we do understand that cults can be dangerous and they have not met the standard where which but there's evidence that, that suggests they are a dangerous cult and we don't have enough evidence to, to overcome that. And I, as a trusted academic mm. who's sorted through the data, mm. I have to take mm. a position and mm. that's the position I take. And mm. I think the reason he doesn't take that position is because of the box that he's in. And it is that box that humanist, atheist, mm. academia, has created and they shouldn't be allowed to comfortably live inside that box. I, I actually agree with all that, except I, is, is that box the result of their humanist, atheist, materialist assumptions? Um, suppose they, you, you know what I mean? I mean, suppose, suppose academia had deeply spiritual, um, deeply spiritual assumptions as, a, as opposed to materialistic ones. 
we'll never know. But as <laughs> our friend Stephen Hawking points out, you know, their art is dead because they haven't kept up with the science, if you will, in this broader term. So until you tackle that problem and understand that consciousness isn't mm-hmm. an illusion, until you grapple with that, you know, we, we won't know, you know. So mm-hmm. it's not that okay. you're, it's not that they're humanist. It's not that they're atheist. It's yeah. the assumptions they're making based on that philosophy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you too. I mean, that, you know, atheism and uh, materialism and scientism is, I don't know about atheism per se, but I mean, I know what you mean. That the, the biological robot in the meaningless universe worldview is sort of the assumption of, of our intellectual culture. I, I did want to ask, though, whether every religion then would be a cult. Every organization. I mean, as my old, uh, you know, influential philosopher Krishnamurti would would note, would probably insist every religion or and every institution is is I guess a cult as you would understand it, as you would define it. Governments certainly are, I suppose, and in terms of what they do, the secrecy and the harm that they cause. So what do we do then? I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? If we're going to hold Scientology accountable, but the Catholic Church, I mean, where do, you, where do you stop? And is it possible? Is it possible to have an organization without it being all the things eventually that you don't like about Scientology? Yeah, I mean, this is now getting to the question at hand where we can kind of pretend that we have this kind of master control (laughs) of everything, which we don't. But until somebody kicks off the discussion, then no one can kick off the discussion. So I I think, though, embedded in that, I would phrase it slightly differently. The, The where do we stop question, we don't stop. No, you keep asking Mm. that question over and over again. Do Mm. you stop with the Catholic Church? No. Do you stop with the LDS Church? No. Do you stop with the Baptist Church? No. You keep asking the same question. You keep saying, and that's why I flashed up on the screen this little snippet I pulled from an interview you did, and this was your point of Mm. moral responsibility and Mm. criminal culpability. Somewhere in there, I think, are the makings of a new way of trying to understand, of trying to look at spirituality Mm. as it becomes institutionalized and giving us a real important, meaningful look at it, rather than just this Mm. fairy tale, meaningless, Mm. and in, in some ways, completely conspiratorial you know i mean i don't know mm-hmm. what we're to make of hugh urban but is he is he doing an inc- incredible disservice to people who have been engaged in a dangerous cult that is scientology mm. i could make the case that he is and even though you know we could say well gosh who would well, don't we need someone who's you know writes a nice book out there that gives a balanced perspective well that may be true but we have to weigh that against what that means to respecting the rights of victims who've been victimized by a dangerous cult. So I think it, this is a question that we have to ask. And I would see, and I know you're kind of playing devil's advocate, and that's why I love it because it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's hard for you. But I think like where you're coming from with the Krishnamurti stuff, yeah, hell yes. I mean, that's mm. who you are, and that's what where you're coming from. So, don't you don't you agree, Rich? Don't you agree? <laughs> I mean, I guess so. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I, I, I. On the other hand, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, um, if we shut down the Catholic Church as a criminal organization, besides that being, you know, not just not. Feasible. Well, maybe it is. I mean, I, I, I suppose, um, but, um, you know, or, or Scientology. I mean, be, you know, and the legal ramifications of uh, not the separation of church and state that I suppose it would raise and all that kind of stuff. Would it be a good thing to do? I mean, what would happen to religions? Uh, we what would shouldn't you- concern ourselves with whether it's a good thing to do. We should concern ourselves with whether it's the right thing to do. And that's why I you know, love just your little snippet there of moral responsibility and criminal culpability. And I think it's not an either or thing. It's a both thing. So 
if you put yourself out there as a religious institution, then you're putting yourself out there as a spiritual institution. And then you're claiming to the public that you are upholding a certain moral responsibility and certainly mm. a criminal culpability. And yeah. to the extent that you don't measure up, I mean, we don't have the power and Hugh Urban doesn't have the power and Jeff Kripal doesn't have the power to shut down the Catholic Church. But they do have the power to take a well-reasoned mm. position yeah. on just what that is in the same way that I so uh, you know, appreciate when Rupert Sheldrick is able to say, Richard Wiseman was intentionally deceptive in the way he carried out research with me. Yeah. That yeah. clarifies things. We yeah. need that clarity in religious studies, comparative religions, yeah. all those phony <laughs> baloney departments in the social sciences. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I, I can't but agree. You win, Alex Securus. I give up. I, no, I did, I did want to ask you, though, um, if, it's, if it's okay. Um, do you think that the, the contemporary and a lot of uh, you know, feminist philosophers and postmodernists sort of uh, have made this claim that the sort of this ideal of the clinically detached, critically detached, objective, impartial, unbiased observer, fly on the wall, God's eye view of a situation who doesn't make value judgments or anything like that, which is the, really, and then the intellectual world is the scholarly ideal, right? Especially in the social sciences and certainly in philosophy. Do you think that that has put those people unwittingly in the service of forces that are very biased, but can hide behind that and, and can enable them to hide behind that veneer of supposed objectivity to actually push an agenda? I'm going to answer that question with another question, and that is the question that's, that's raised by another person that you greatly admire, and for good reason, because I admire him as well, and that's Thich Nhat Hanh. And the quote that I was sharing with folks who are watching it is, we run during the daytime, we run during our sleep. We do not know how to stop. When we can look deeply into the present moment, we can look deeply into our true nature and we can discover the ultimate dimension. And the reason I think that quote is so significant is because it gets at the core question of spirituality that we've so lost in all this nonsense. <laughs> mm. And that is, is there an ultimate dimension to be discovered? What could we know about that ultimate dimension? How would we interact with that ultimate dimension? So now I'm substituting ultimate dimension in the way that I normally talk about extended consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I'm suggesting that what the beauty and the power of what Thich Nhat Hanh and so many others that I've talked about on this show, the power of what they're doing is they're they're, they're misunderstood as being talking about some airy fairy mm. philosophical shit. They're saying, mm. no, there really is another dimension out there. There is another energy out there. There is another reality. And if we don't approach it, or at least ask that as a question, we'll never be able to answer the question that, that, that you asked. So I think mm. that has to be on the table. Yeah. I agree. Uh, and, and, and do you think that so much, all this stuff from biological robots in a meaningless universe for, for philosophy to the, the distractions of our commercial culture and the propagandized infotainment nature of our media and everything else, do you think that those are designed to prevent us from I guess this really gets to the heart of whether this is how much of it, how deeply does this sort of conspiracy go? Do you think these things are deliberately designed to prevent us from engaging that ultimate dimension that Thich Nhat Hanh talks about? Let me turn that around and ask you, do you think that is a possibility that we need to consider? 
I, I, she's more than well, I mean, if it's even, uh, yeah, I mean, if it's even possible, it's the most important, right? I, I mean, it seems to me that it is the most important thing we need to consider. And what the, well, besides the nature of, of this ultimate dimension itself, which I guess is the most important thing to consider, but, but why are we being prevented from, from attaining that? And, and even worse, are there forces that are deliberately trying to distract us from that because of the way they can benefit from it. Now, I can see where that would be the case in the academic world and in the commercial world, just because maybe, I don't know if those people have that profound view of, of reality. They just know if you keep them distracted and addicted and, 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 and superficial, they'll buy. And that's all we really give a damn about. We haven't even thought about anything deeper than that. And then in the academic world, we keep them scared and conformist and afraid to really do any original thinking, but just mimic the jargon that we approve of it'll make it'll keep us in power and our, it, it contribute to our prestige as scholars but is there something and this is what i mean and, and truly this is i come to you as a as a, as a, <laughs> as a sage in this dimension of of existence because you've really and i really mean that in a serious tone because you've devoted your you know a good part of your life now to really um, examining that on a level and in a way that that just that nobody else is doing. So, okay, what I'm asking is in this long-winded way is, uh, what do you think? I mean, how deep how deep is the conspiracy, in your opinion? Is it beyond C just C Rich. Dumb? C Rich, this is great because I'm really sucking you in now. <laughs> because because this larger project that I want yeah. to get you to help yeah. me with is answering the question of evil and not for the sake of evil, mm -hmm. but because in the same way that if you get consciousness wrong, then you can't get science right. Yeah. If you get evil wrong, then you can't get consciousness right mm -hmm. or extended mm -hmm. consciousness right. Mm -hmm. So the tricky part that you're alluding to, and you're yeah. phrasing it as a question because you're a smooth yeah. dog. <laughs> That's a real question. I, really, I don't know. Well, I, th <laughs> I think based on my little bit of investigation into who you are and your philosophy, that you have a strong inclination. And it, mm -hmm. it, it really, I think, speaks to this broader question of uh, Luciferianism mm -hmm. and, you yeah. know, do, do what thou wilt. Yeah, and yeah, is there anything yeah. wrong with that? And in particular, when we look at our larger culture and say that our culture is certainly a reflection of that value system, yeah. but we all embrace that. Is there anything wrong with that? So mm. that's a very, uh, I think, unclear middle ground. But where I've gone, and I've, again, folks, I've pumped a lot of interviews Rich's way, and he's been so generous with his time to review these and talk to me about it and engage in email conversations. So where well, I am trying to pull them into a, a bigger project on this is that I've kind of gone to the extreme and I've said, let's, let's kind of clear up the, the, the smoke and the mirrors, mm -hmm. because I just had mm -hmm. a post from a, a guy I really like, a friend of mine, Mike Patterson, who's on the skeptical forum. We we're kind of chatting about good and evil. And he goes, Hey man, I think the catch and release of, uh, you know, brownies in the brook of trout are, you know, that's kind of evil. Why do you want to traumatize that fish and mm. stuff like that? And I'm like, oh, okay, I kind of get that. It doesn't really reach my level of evil in the same way it does for Annika Lucas, yeah. who was sold by her mother at six years old into a sex cult in Belgium, who we later find out was engaging in satanic practices, whatever you make of that, and was just repeatedly, un unthinkably abused and mm. raped and just tortured to the point where they were going to kill her. And she was yeah. on this chopping block that was soaked in the blood of hundreds of kids they had already murdered. And only by luck, if you want to call it that, she's spared by one of mm. the people in the cult who mm. actually gets her out and that person later pays for it with their life. So mm. you think, folks, if there still are doubters, I haven't heard from people who've listened to that interview because I haven't published it yet. But if you think there's any doubt to her story, if you think she's making all this up, 
I really encourage you to investigate that fully and see if you can maintain that belief. But my point before I get way, way too far afield is that's a little bit easier to hone in on and say, yeah, that sounds pretty evil to me. And it mm -hmm. also sounds to me like they were intentionally trying to connect with a malevolent force in the extended consciousness realm. That's what mm -hmm. they were doing. And You're it talking isn't about just, uh, Parsons and, um, and, and, um, no, no. Now I'm talking about the oh, people, you're talking about the, okay. the people that abused Annika Lucas oh, were satanic. Okay. Mm, yeah. So I don't know what that means. I want to explore what that means. Cause I don't accept mm. a, a strict Christian understanding of that. And we're going right. to expand on that too. But when they're talking about satanic ritual abuse, they're not doing those rituals to get anything more like physically. Mm -hmm. It's they are making an intentional effort to connect with an extended realm in yeah. the same way, paralleling what Jack mm -hmm. Parsons and L. Ron yeah. Hubbard is doing. So we need to understand that. We don't yeah. need to gloss over it with a Hugh Urban, well, they certainly think mm. it did, which by the way is the same thing that Chris Shelton winds up saying because he's locked into mm. an atheist, critical thinker, pseudo-skeptic <laughs> kind of thing. You yeah. can't get there from here if you don't understand that. And the point is evil clarifies it. That mm. level of evil clarifies and says, okay, something is going on there that I need to talk about. And then I need to understand, I need to incorporate mm -hmm. into my worldview. And mm -hmm. then I guess I'd ask you, Rich, where, how does that fit with, and this is narrowly, yeah. how does that fit with the question that you asked me? If that is a reality, then, ah, you know, what's the big deal if a guy is, you know, trying to sell a few more widgets and mm. whatever way he can yeah. do it does it mm. really matter you know playing mm. fast and loose with the kind of mm. luciferian do what thou wilt yeah. i don't know what do you think yeah i i, I don't know i really i that that's where i i have i'm i'm intrigued and and i think it's very important to draw the connections um again it's certainly in a lot of people's interest to push you know the materialist worldview and to um, and I, I, certainly, you know, in a lot of people's interests, I suppose to push uh, the, you know, the, whatever it is. And again, but, but again, I don't know what it is that motivates people in satanic cults, really. Um, you know what I mean? I, I don't, um, know what it is that's motivating those people or, and who's directing it. And, and, and is it, is it beyond, you know, is it, is it something that goes as deep or high as, as the government that's deliberately trying to promulgate this kind of stuff or, and promote it? Or is it deeper than that? Do the Gnostics have it right? I mean, that, that's really the kind of thing that I assume you've started to develop a worldview about. That's why I have a tremendous affinity with what you're kind of bringing forth with this moral responsibility, criminal culpability. And yeah. uh, as grandiose as it might seem, this idea that we can kind of suggest a new paradigm with which to understand extended consciousness realm and understand it from a serious intellectual standpoint. And I think it, it requires a reboot. It requires mm. a real reboot. And, and in that, I think we would want to be really careful in the way that you're talking about in some of your stories as a criminal investigator, we'd want to be really careful about rushing to a lot of conclusions, mm. but we would want to be really aggressive in pointing out the huge failings of what we have currently. So yeah. that's kind of where I'm coming from. Gotcha. Yeah, I certainly agree. <laughs> I can't disagree with that. All right. You don't know what you just signed up for. As we wrap yeah. things up here, do you want to tell folks uh, what else is going on in, in your world and what else um, you do when you're not being harangued by? I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing some research and, uh, and publishing um, on uh, I, a book chapter that's coming out with Bloomsbury. I think you can pre-order it now in a book about uh, the philosophy of Sri Aurobindo and my, my, my contribution is in, re in respect to his philosophy of mind and metaphysics with, um, and how it maps on to 
traditional Western philosophies of mind. So it certainly speaks to the, the skeptical constituency. And then uh, doing an article that uh, you, you were kind enough to, to subject yourself to on uh, uh, scientism in Western culture and uh, Maslow's, Abe Maslow's little known book, The Psychology of, uh, of Science. And uh, a couple of other projects along those lines with uh, collaborating with, with scholarly peers as, as, <laughs> as valueless as the such scholarship might be and superficial. Well, but uh, I, I don't, I no, don't I'm not only kidding. That, right? I mean, <laughs> I'm only joking. That wasn't fair. <laughs> we, we, have to, we have to reform. We have to try yeah. and reform it and kind of I agree with you no I, I I completely agree with you and again that's why I went on that rant about about, about the, the ac academic culture being you know because they sell themselves as the paragons of intellectual freedom and imagination and creative thought and you know liberating your mind and when they're just the opposite right well they, you know you know what this is, this is like what I always yeah. say about uh like in the broader conspiracy world yeah. about like kind of 9-11 or like all, all Hope yeah. is lost, really, in this yeah. kind of post-constitutional age that we live yeah. in, you know, and yeah. like my interview with Richard Dolan and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. yeah, But it's like, hey, the Navy commercials are our best hope, right? A force for good. <laughs> yeah. A force for good and the yeah. boys sailing out. The, we, yeah. we should aspire to that. So yeah. in the same way, great. You go ahead. Yeah. You keep... You keep yeah. talking about freedom and truth yeah. and all that stuff, you academic tower yeah. living people, because <laughs> yeah. that's what Great. we want. We want you on that tower. We need you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely, absolutely. And that is one reason why I've never been particularly. I've, I've been, a, I've been a very half-hearted scholar. I'm, um, you know, I, I've just never been. You know, it's a game you really have to play seriously and abide by really rigid rules and devote yourself to it in a very disciplined kind of way to make a to make a name for yourself in it like like a Hugh Urban so I, I respect him you know what he's had to do um in order to do that but again he's he's limited by the constraints of the sac of the, you know the monastic order that he's joined you know so that is a very personal question that I guess I wasn't going to ask but since you brought it up yeah. <laughs> I will ask it yeah and that is, do you think your particular academic journey has given you more freedom? Because a lot of people would look mm -hmm. at it and say, God, this guy teaches online classes. Mm -hmm. He also teaches at Florida State College. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's not an Ivy League school. Right. So, you know, but I get the sense that in a lot of ways, You've, you've managed to use that to your benefit. When I talk to these other folks like I'm mm. talking about, there is yeah. a weight on their freaking mm -hmm. shoulders mm -hmm. that they can't, they can't escape. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, that's a really, that was, that, that's a, that's very observant. Uh, um, I would say, yeah, I've, I've, I've somehow managed to carve an, an unconventional enough path for myself within that community that I have pretty good access to a lot of the interesting and, and, and valuable, I don't know, resources that, and, and, um, and opportunities that, a, that an academic has while not having to endure the the really, I, again, I, 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 and again, I don't think they, they'd think it, they, they wouldn't consider it. They, they don't think it's, it's a, um, it's a rigid, you know, hidebound um, ordeal. I think but they I, do. I think they do. You think they do? Them, I, I think they really, do. Really? You do, huh? Maybe yeah, I so. I mean, I think, I think Hugh, Hugh Urban has, has, I mean, frick, I, I hate to even say this, you know, Brian Hayden, you know, yeah. as soon as you make the Royal Society, we'll pick on Brian Hayden for a while. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you're the Royal Society of yeah. Anthropology. Yeah. And you're, you, you don't want to not be invited next year. Mm. Yeah, to the, to the pre cocktail mm. hour where they have those <laughs> yeah. little smoked yeah. salmon, yeah. Canadian <laughs> smoked salmon. Yeah. You don't want to be left out yeah. of that group. When yeah. it's easier yeah. for you when you said, you know, I wasn't invited last year. I might not be <laughs> invited this year, but yeah. I can go. You, you can say, I can go, you know, pluck down a couple hundred bucks and go to the Parapsychology Association yep. meeting and I can get. And I can talk to people on a, you know, and I can really yeah. 
Yeah. I don't know. I, I, it, I get it helps. that. It's, anyway. Yeah, it's liberating in some ways, but in, in other ways, um, you know, uh, Donald Hoffman has a, has a huge constituency that cares about what Donald Hoffman says, or same thing with Hugh Urban, whereas, you know, nobody, you know, I, 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 you know, I publish a, a paper once in a while or a book chapter and I'll give a paper at a conference or something, but nobody cares what, you know, I really don't. You're not, nobody you're cares playing it. in the, nobody you're cares playing nobody in the cares. minor leagues. It's the, you know, it, it's not as, uh, you're not as famous as guys we're in all the in the minor leagues yeah. we're all in the minor leagues and i mean that for with all mm. respect to you yeah. know donald hoffman mm. go go talk to my kids you know 25 that's years true. old yeah, who's donald true. Hoffman? that's true yeah i talked to yeah. somebody the other day yeah. i said uh, yeah, yeah you know i just i just had an interview with richard dolan no i said this to three people i interview with richard dolan which i was mm. just so delighted yeah. about because i so respect him and he's so uh highly regarded in the ufo community Boom, doesn't move the meter an inch. PewDiePie, yeah. that's who we're all chasing, right? Yeah. PewDiePie is the most respected. Yeah. I like PewDiePie, by the way. But yeah. it's like, are you kidding? This yeah. is all just, you know, mm. if we're going to measure it by, by that, I think the only True. way to measure it is we just have to try and advance the ball and yeah. not be too attached to the results, which yeah. I think your mentors and my mentors would, would kind of agree with. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. And and I again I think that's what you've managed to do. You've managed to create this this forum in which you can engage these great and access really these great minds um, and people who are you know playing in the major leagues of the of the ac their academic fields um, and really and really push them. But you can also do it in ways that their colleagues can't because they're not free to do that. They're not free to go there. I think you've done the same thing with this show. So. Well, that's nice of you to say, you know, I remember a, a long time ago, I mean, I didn't do it kind of intentionally. I just did it because the way I was coming from it, my expectations and the fact, the big thing was that I didn't have any financial expectations from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, and I yeah. had never designed the show to do that. But I remember a long time ago talking to uh, Dean Radin and uh, I talked to him really early on. And then I talked to him a few minutes later. And he goes, hmm. you know, you've really kind of done something here because you're truly independent. Yeah. And yep. it didn't quite strike me and then I th until later. I go, oh, I see what he means. I really get to just, yeah. because I don't have that financial mm -hmm. component baked in, and because I'm not interested in giving keynote speeches at anyone's mm -hmm. conferences, and I've turned yeah. them down when I've gotten them, mm -hmm. it does give me an ability to kind of just do my own thing in a way that I certainly like. And in the longer lens, I think has served... A, a, a purpose in terms of a certain yeah. independent objectivity, yeah. even though it's opinionated, you know, it's highly opinionated by me, but it's like, it's yeah. just my opinion. It's not right. somebody else's. But, and again, and you know, Rupert Sheldrake pointed that out that he thinks you're, I, you said it several times how, uh, that your show is, you know, does important work for those reasons. But, you know, I think uh, too, you you tend to be such a, um, you're sort of like, I, I, I don't know what your political leanings are. You're sort of an, an intellectual libertarian anyway. As far as ideas go, you're sort of a libertarian. You're like, throw them out there in the free market and, and you know, and see how they fly and, and let everybody hash it out and see who's, you know, who, uh, what, let everybody come to their own conclusions. It's like you tend to be an iconoclastic sort of, I, at least I sense that in you, and an individualistic kind of thinker. And that's that's a, a luxury that... Um, I mean, <laughs> that you just don't have. And, and as you suggest, maybe that's the point, that that's, it's on purpose that you don't have that luxury in the established institutions. That's what worries me. Wow. I'm getting that's paranoid. A, no, that, that's, a great, that's a great point there. So, Rich, it's been just awesome. Again, having you on, our guest has been Dr. Richard Grego. You'll find his past interviews. I'll try and include those in the show notes because they're really good. You want to check those out. And I'll have a link to his website where you can check out his work. Rich, thanks again for joining me. Always a pleasure. Thanks.